Here we are uh, with Tien, the founder of Pendle. Um, very excited to have you on the Define podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I would describe Pendle as a DeFi protocol allowing traders to do all kinds of crazy stuff with yield, basically. Um, you've had some amazing growth recently, just shot over uh, 2 billion in TVL in just you know a few months. Um, and I really think that you guys are pushing innovation forward in decentralized finance. So I'm very uh, excited to learn more about you know all, all the details of the protocol. So if we can just uh, start by briefly describing Pendle in as simple terms as you can, and then we'll get into specifics later. This is actually a relatively challenging one, but my way of thinking of Pendle in simple term is um, it's a protocol to trade the earnings of an asset. Yeah, so, so as an example, right? So when you deposit ETH into Lido, you get STETH. So STETH in itself is generating yield. So we're not trade. So in this case, the underlying is um, the 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 actual underlying is ether. Um, the yield is in the form of STETH. Uh, so what we do is we and and the STETH is generating some form of APYs, right? So we are enabling the trading of the the APY component of an asset. Yeah. So. Uh, I think with that, there are more use cases that we can go about in in the subsequent segment. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a good start. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's uh, before uh, going into more details, I'd love to also learn about you. Like, uh, what's your background? How did you get into crypto, and what led you to uh, to creating Pendle? Yeah, sure. So I've actually been involved in crypto. For, I think this would be my 10th year. Um, I started out as a research assistant for a professor back in school and was looking into all the different types of fintech business uh, businesses uh, and, and chanced upon a, a product that utilized Bitcoin as a remittance tool. So I thought it was a very different proposition compared to the other products out there. For example, like TransferWise, Western Union. So they're basically revamping an existing model um, with some innovation in the business uh, in, in the business model. But at a technical level, there, there was hardly any innovation. Whereas Bitcoin mm -hmm. was something that was fundamentally different. So that got me interested in the technology, and I started to look deeper into crypto and blockchain. So 2015, I became interested in Ethereum because um, uh, that was also when Ethereum community was born and the ICO. Um, and then I, I got involved peripherally as a community contributor, um, not quite in the technical sense, but really just forming meetup groups uh, online, offline mm -hmm. to, to, to just be more involved in that segment. So through this particular opportunity, I got to know Loy, who is the co-founder of Kyber. And when he started out Kyber, I joined as one of the founding team members to lead the business development and the community development uh, for the protocol. So I stayed on at Kyber, um, had a lot of good times over there uh, until the end of 2018, after which I decided to take a step back and and do a sabbatical. Um, so during 2019 and 2020, I was mostly experimenting with various business ideas uh, with my current set of co-founders in and outside of crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, I think in 2020, we decided to work on Pendle. Um, and the motivation for it was because DeFi summer. In, in 2020, I think there was a frenzy around food coins and these food coins were offering maybe 10, 20,000 percent in APY. So we were farming these coins and we were very interested in seeing how we could lock in the yield, even if it's not 10,000 percent APY, a few hundred percent in APY would be very nice too. But there was no instrument for us to express a view. And so that, that prompted us to think about how we can structure a solution to enable 
what we were looking for. And I think also innately, we were looking for something that offers certainty. Um, so that was, I think, a very, very core motivation for our, our, our current set of design. Great story. I, uh, I think that, uh, that DeFi summer was really the, you know, unlocking of, uh, of so many different DeFi experiments uh, with, you know, yield farming. Um, and now it, it turns out that Pendle was born out of that time as well. Um, I, I, it was so crazy to see those like thousand percent APYs. So yeah, interesting to, to hear that motivated you to find an instrument where you can, you could um, lock in that yield or, you know, uh, express your view on whether, you know, what direction those yields would go. Because at the time it was really, you know, you'd see a thousand percent plus on some food coin and then it would obviously, you know, disappear and the next food coin would, uh, would rally and, and so yeah. on. So lots of volatility yeah. and uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. So it took us a while actually to mm. get from that stage until now, this is going to be our fourth year running the protocol. Mm. I think the first two years were relatively difficult. We didn't have a lot of traction because again, in 2020 and 2021, the market was just extremely euphoric. A lot of people were, um, there were too many products for, for people to experiment with. And a lot of these products were offering very, very attractive yields. So for us, the, the product proposition, I think, made sense, but the UX was complicated. So mm-hmm. in itself, I think that deterred quite a lot of people from participating in the protocol. And then the learning, uh, the, the education required to appreciate derivatives uh, was also quite, quite, uh, quite, quite steep. Uh, and in all, with all the different types of products out there that users could choose from, um, we were not a priority naturally. Mm. Yeah. So what was the, the um, first iteration of Pendle? Like what was that uh, product about? Yeah, so it's the same. I think in terms of direction, we have always been very consistent, which is mm-hmm. to have a venue for this for, 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 for yield trading. And um, so I think the basic mechanics involves the splitting of a yield bearing asset into principal token and yield token. And with the separation of these two components, we allow for um, the, the, two, the two parts to be traded independently. Mm-hmm. So if a user wants fixed yield, they can purchase PT. If a user wants to speculate on the yield of the underlying, uh, they can purchase YT. So that remains the same. What's changed is the, the AMM that facilitates the, mm-hmm. the uh, transfer of assets and also the price discovery. Um, and I think more importantly is how we've also been a lot more aggressive in finding use cases and approaching users. Yeah. Can you dive up uh, more into that? Like, what do you mean? One of the things that we realized about V1, um, was that, so, so th- this kind of, um, this was us trying to test our hypothesis on whether the product would make sense or not. And in 2021, we listed Wonderland, which is an asset that offers extremely high APY. Um, it's an Olympus fork on Avalanche. So I think we're looking at 7,000 to 15,000% in APY because of the rate of compounding. Now we supported that asset and it was very, very well received by the community. So our daily trading volume was in the millions, which was a very significant feat for us back in the days. And from that particular experiment, it occurred to us that that product would make sense um, to like, provided that the asset is very volatile uh, in its yield. Um, But for most other assets, like say USDT, USDC, because the rates were relatively consistent, usually not to degen, nothing more than 20% most of the time. And in the absence of leverage, um, users would be less reluctant to trade yield and they would be much more comfortable with just holding the asset and then um, anticipate the floating yield. So that that was, I think, a particular 
experience that that um, cemented our belief in this direction. And then we took a lot of learnings from the implementation of V1. So for example, how we designed the AMM. Um, so in, in V2, the AMM is fundamentally different from the AMM of V1. V2, we focus on minimizing the impermanent loss consideration for users because with as with AMMs, when the two assets in a pool diverge in, in price directions, the impermanent loss becomes more significant. So in, in order to negate that effect, we have assets that are extremely high in correlation to be put in the pool. So in the case of Pendle, it's the underlying, which can be STETH and the principal token of STETH. So these two assets are extremely correlated. And if a user deposits the asset and hold it until maturity, there's no impermanent loss. And then that's that's one improvement in the AMM. And then secondly, the way we structure the AMM is to allow, like basically allows the liquidity providers to continue to get yield from the underlying protocol. So again, as an example, um, if a user deposit STETH into the pool, they will continue to receive the yield from STETH. And then on top of that, swap fees from Pendle Pool and uh, Pendle Incentive as well. So we try to reduce the cost, the opportunity cost for users to participate in Pendle. And then and then we, we, we kind of package that into um, a product in itself to market to institutions and also DeFi communities. Recently, you guys really exploded. Uh, I, I think you started the year with around 300 million TVL, which is, you know, still a, 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 a decent number. So you were already growing. Um, but in the past couple of months, it, you know, it really shot up to over 2 billion. So what different factors do you think influenced this growth? I think there are multiple levels. Um, but I think ultimately the product, I think the product makes sense. So um, for a good part of last year, so we launched Pendle V2 at the end of 2022. And for the good part of last year, we have been iterating the product, um, collecting feedbacks and how like basically optimize the, the UI UX. So the product, in my opinion, has to make sense to begin with. And then the other thing uh, on top of that, right, is that we were also very aggressive in our investment in business development and growth efforts because we recognize that our product is innately complex because uh, again, most people do not come into the space knowing how yield trading works. So there's a lot of education that we need to inculcate um, in, 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 in users. So this is where I think our growth effort um, ties in with business development because most of the time we have to, I mean, it's, it's one thing to put up the documentation, but it's also, it's another thing, completely another, uh, another, another, uh, scope altogether to structure materials, uh, from existing, um, like case studies and, and share it with the broader community and, um, help them understand the product proposition. So I remember in 2023, when we launched our product, we were still very small and we were probably sitting like eight to $10 million in TVL. So we reached out to protocols that were much bigger than us to try to establish some sort of partnership that could basically allow us to work alongside the much bigger brands. So in January last year, we had been extremely uh, fortunate to to um, construct a partnership between like Pendle, Balancer, Rocket Pool, and, and Aura. So it, it became like a four-way collaboration to collectively broadcast uh, what, what, what Pendle was uh, trying to promote to the community. So ultimately what we did was, um, it, because we were really optimizing the strategy to uh, maximize the APY for users. So we started with the base asset, which was Rocket RETH that was deposited in Balancer pool. And then the LP token from Balancer gets deposited into Aura. And this Aura is um, like panel built on top of Aura. So it effectively, right, if a user 
participates in the Aura pool on Pendle, the user gets exposure to multi layers of yield. Now, so this um, is, I'd say, like one of the first successful case studies that we have incorporated. Uh, and subsequently, we use that as our prime example of how users could benefit from our protocol to construct like similar um, examples with other LST protocols. So this is, I think, like um, how we were tying the business development aspect with growth. And then um, I, th I think also very importantly, we have been very timely with the, the, the way we captured narratives. So we have uh, definitely benefited from multiple waves of uh, narratives. So we started with the LSD last year, and then we also proceeded with Arbitrum um, around late Q1, early Q2. So when Arbitrum rose in popularity, we also benefited from the, 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 the rise of uh, Arbitrum. And then Q3, there was also the RWA um, frenzy. So a lot of people were speculating on T-build yields like around 5%, relatively low risk. And we also jumped, jumped, jumped on the bandwagon and supported a couple of assets like SDI, SFREX, and also FUSDC. So, um, and then fast forward early this year, we were all in on restaking. So I think collectively, just looking back, right, we prepared our product for um, different times. And then most of the times when we identified a major trend and narrative that we want to focus on, we really get involved in the business development and the growth efforts to make sure that we construct very solid um, case studies. And then we try to grow that particular case studies across many different different products that are that are from the same segment. And then we we establish ourselves as one of the players in that segment. Got it. Super interesting strategy. And I love kind of the the story behind Pendle because it it looks like an overnight success um, for you know kind of people watching the industry. Like Pendle seem to kind of come out of nowhere. Um, but you guys, I mean, you've been really grinding for years. Um, and so it looks like you you started like really ex experimenting and, and looking at what to build back in like 2018, like the very kind of early, early days of DeFi, then uh, 2020 DeFi summer, you actually, you know, found uh, your idea of like split splitting base asset like principal and yield um but then it it, it took uh, iterations on, on that model like v1 your amm wasn't quite there um then you you improved your amm and uh, introduced this i i guess like the the the, the first product that had real uh, fit was the wonderland token um, with, with a really high volatile yield. And then that's when you realize, okay, like people aren't willing to really go with, through all this trouble to split stable coin yields because, you know, they're, they're pretty stable. Done. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's, uh, that, that was like your first learning, um, and then improving the AMM. And then it looks like, uh, this past year, like all through 2023, you really started, uh, doing, uh, like business development efforts and, and like writing all these different yield related uh, narratives um, that has re really positioned you perfectly until, you know, this moment where like, it seems like the stars are, are aligning for a bull market and just like points and restaking, liquid staking, like all these um, things that are, are yeah. suited for your protocol. I think, I think um, it's interesting that you put it that way. Um, I, I also want to add, right, like mm -hmm. restaking. Yeah. So, so like working with points is actually not something new. So actually last year, as we were focusing on the LST assets, like for, I, I think like the entirety of last year, we've always had a pocket of, um, like we've always reserved like some space for LST assets because we think LST assets would, would always be relevant. And then behind our mind, we were thinking that, so like di during different parts of the year, LST 
became less prominent because there were other more uh, prominent trends like Arbitrum and Real Asset. Mm -hmm. But, at, you know, during those points, we, we were thinking, we were aware that Eigenlayer was in the development. And we thought that if Eigenlayer appeared, the, they would revitalize interest in ETH assets, which means that there would be another round of interest in ETH derivatives. So which in this case was um, LRT. And, and so, so that was like our faith in Ethereum, like the, the like ETH assets. Then the points was actually a fairly interesting one because last year we worked with Swell and Swell was offering pearls and they were also using Pendle as a venue to distribute pearls to uh, a wider user base. So we've had some experience working with off-chain tabulation of like points distribution to, to users of Pendle and, and working with the issuer. Um, so when it comes to Eigenlayer point and all this like restaking protocols, it wasn't new to us. It, it just far exceeded our expectation uh, in terms of the adoption. Yeah. DeFi Saver is an all-in-one management app for decentralized finance that provides access to top lending protocols in the Ethereum ecosystem. With support from protocols such as Aave, Maker, Compound, Spark, Liquidity, and Morpho Blue, and features such as one transaction leverage management, collateral and debt swaps, protocol shifts, and various automation features, it aims to make management of your on-chain positions much easier. Check it out at DeFiSaver.com. Can you get into uh, in in more detail how you guys are um, uh, you know leveraging points or or uh, or unlocking you know this uh, this narrative for your users? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think um, so. Points points are not new concepts. It's just that like points when when um, coupled with like big innovative protocols like Eigenlayer, uh, people start to take it a lot more seriously. And, um, um, and, and what we saw was an opportunity to create a marketplace to potentially speculate on these points. And we offer some sort of leverage to it. But this leverage does not involve any kind of margin accounts. So there's no liquidation risk. Now, how it works is, um, like effectively what panel does is to split a yield bearing asset into the principal token and yield token. So the principal token is, um, the, basically the principal component of, uh, a yield bearing asset. And then the yield token is the part that accrues all the yield and the points. So again, I think like, uh, with respect to, um, restaking asset like ETH, for example, so ETH uh, it on its own is a yield bearing asset and it generates yield. And on top of that, they're also earning eigenlayer points and, and they're all, uh, ether five points. So how we segment the, uh, PTYT is for all the eigenlayer points and, the uh, ETH five points to, to accrue to YT. Um, and in Pendle's case, there's actually a very fundamental rule and that, that establishes a relationship between PT and YT. So every PT, when added to a YT, has to equal to the value of one particular underlying. Meaning to say, right, one PT plus one YT equals to one underlying in, in, in value. Now, when you take the YT, um, and now, now because YT is accruing a lot of points, so the demand for YT naturally increases. And as YT becomes more demanded, the, the, the price of YT would also go up. Now, if we go back to, to, the, to the rule that, that I established earlier, right? One PT plus one YT equals to one underlying. The underlying price remains the same. Now, if PT increases in value, that means PT would have to lower in, in, in value. PT becomes lower in value, right? In order to uh, respect the, the, the equation. Now, so in this case, I think that creates a very interesting dynamics where a lot of people who are very bullish on YT because they are bullish on ETH5 would 
want to acquire the, the YT. And as a result, with, with more demand in YT, it also creates an opportunity for PT interest, uh, interested parties as well. Because when YT price goes up, PT price will, 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 will have to come down. So PT becomes cheaper. Then for users who are interested in the fixed yield, on the asset, then they would buy the PT. So as an example, um, ETH5 was listed on Binance, uh, was trading on Binance yesterday, uh, on, on Monday. And uh, as a, uh, following that, a lot of interest goes into, like there, there's a lot of interest in the ETH YT on Pendle. So currently ETH uh, YT is trading at around 40% implied yield. And that means PT is trading at 40% discount uh, relative to, to its underlying. So this these are, I think, like the relatively interesting dynamics that we're seeing today. Now, specific to how the leverage comes about, typically, YT is a smaller component of a yield-bearing asset. So um, one YT, sorry, one, one ETH um, is probably equivalent to the value of 10 YTs. So as a user, if I am extremely bullish on ETH5, I would sell my ETH to buy 10 YTs. And with all this, uh, with, with 10 YTs, right? Suddenly I have 10 times the yield exposure of the ETH um, token. So I, I get like 10 times the points exposure. Um, and then on top of that, we structured uh, some sort of, uh, of arrangement with the EtherFi, which uh, entitles the Pendle participants two times the multiplier. So that then that becomes a lot more interesting for um, uh, purchase uh, participants. Trying to kind of break break that down a, a little bit. Mm. Um, so this is one use case that uh, Pendle offers uh, specifically with um, EtherFi. Uh, the the yield on the ETH token plus mm. the points that uh, those tokens can accrue, right? Mm. And this is because um, EtherFi is a liquid restaking token that gets yield from Eigenlayer and Eigenlayer gets yield from the Ethereum uh, network. Um, so, you know, just m making sure that everyone listening is up to date with you know all the different layers involved here. So yes, yes. Um, Ethereum proof of stake generates yield. Uh, there are um, these protocols that uh, first you know uh, can um, uh, create tokens representing the yield uh, on on Ethereum, and then there's Eigenlayer, which uh, takes those uh, liquid uh, staking tokens or ETH itself to um, secure other protocols on, on top of Eigenlayer um, mm. and uh, restake staked ETH. And so there's like a second layer of, uh, of uh, yield. Mm. Um, and then EtherFi is uh, one protocol which uh, has a, an additional layer that is generating um, tokens on top of this uh, restaking like Eigenlayer protocol. Correct. Okay, so with that, liquid restaking token generated by um, EtherFi. EtherFi is on top of that restaking yield offering points. And so what Pendle is doing is separating the uh, principal, the value, the underlying value of um, the ETH token and the yield that it generates. And so this yield, again, like comes from all the restaking Ethereum yield Mm. Um, plus points. And so the, the d dynamics, uh, that Tian was saying, you know, how, um, yes, like makes sense. Like PT principal token, YT yield token needs to equal the underlying asset. Mm. Um, and so if there's a lot of demand for YT, then PT price, uh, will, uh, fall. And vice mm. versa. And so the, mm. this creates different opportunities for uh, speculating. Like people will go long on YT, but then um, 
others will want to pick up the, these uh, PT tokens uh, with mm. with a discount. Mm. Um, and there's the the kind of volatile yield that's captured with YT, and then there's a fixed yield uh, side of things, which is is it is that captured always when you when you buy PT? Uh, yes. So buying PT is one way. Selling YT is also another way of mm. uh, just obtaining the fixed yield. But buying PT is a lot more straightforward because PT is like a zero coupon bond. So you buy, let's say like a, a 90 cents to a dollar. And at maturity, you're actually mm -hmm. redeeming the, the, the full amount of a dollar. Right. Mm. And so that... Uh, that difference uh, is kind of the fixed yield that you're getting. Correct. Yes. Right. Um, okay. And then, so this is one one use case with with EtherFi. What other sorts of strategies do you have available? So I think with respect to strategies, we generally try to keep it simple. Um, mm -hmm. So liquidity provision is the simplest and the most straightforward one. Um, again, I think for liquidity providers, most most of the time, users are entitled to the, the points that they would originally be entitled to. And then on top of that, they're also earning yields in the form of panel tokens because like there's liquidity incentive. And I think today, bulk of the APY is actually from the swap fees because mm -hmm. there's actually quite a lot of trading activities in the AMM. And as liquidity provider, a portion of the fee will actually be attributed to the liquidity provider. So these are the various components of, of um, the LP APY. So as a user, if you don't want to express a view in say PT or YT, LP is always an option. And if you deposit the liquidity in like the asset into the pool and hold it until maturity, there's no impermanent loss. So this is one. And then YT is, as we talked about, if you are extremely bullish, on say ETHFI or Renzo, whichever protocol, you can always buy YT and you are exposed to the points, sometimes with multipliers. So the additional leverage is quite, can be quite substantial and meaningful. And then the third is for someone who is more conservative and reserved and want to just lock in the fixed seal when the APY is attractive, like right now, I think, EETH PT is currently trading at 40% fixed APY. So that could appeal to some users. Then mm. they can consider this particular strategy. And can you re repeat how, how leverage works? Like how do you get the multiplier on YT? Yeah, so the multiplier is actually offered by um, the issuer. So in this case mm. for EtherFi, they offer two times the multiplier for Pendle users. So uh, mm. For most users, yeah, it would probably make sense for them to participate in ETH5 pools through Pendle. Interesting. Okay, so the multiplier comes as a um, a, an incentive it's, directly yes. from whatever protocol you are. Um, Correct. It's 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 a uh, it's an added bonus that is okay. issued by the protocol, uh, the, the issuer protocol. Interesting. Um, what other protocols are you uh, integrating? Yeah. So I think. Right now, um, we have most of the uh, restaking protocols. So Eth EtherFi, Renzo, Kelp, um, Bedrock, uh, Puffer. And then there's also Athena that has garnered a lot of interest when they launch. So, but the thing with Athena is that there is a cap. So I think within like one day, we one day or two days, we filled it, we filled up $200 million of um, interest. And then we set up another pool. And then in in, in one day, it, uh, it, it got filled as well. And yeah. how, for how much was, it, was that second pool? Second pool was 50 million. So okay. now we are yeah exploring ways to increase the capacity. And then because I think the demand for Edina's USDE and SUSDE um, are very high. So uh, we want to see if we can cater to our community. So I think these are still relatively fluid ideas that we're working on. And why did you have to set a cap for Athena? For many reasons, I think. Uh, so the cap is not set by us. The cap is actually set by Athena. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So I think from an operational standpoint, 
because they are a relatively new protocol. And just for, to my understanding, from like a security perspective, um, like just to ensure that their operations can handle the load, they are mm. gradually increasing the cap. Um, and then the other, the other is that they, they are currently running a program. So in order to, sorry, by program, I mean like a shard program. So equivalent mm -hmm. to, to the points. Yeah. So in order to maybe not dilute the pool too much, they want to keep it confined to a certain segment of users. So interesting. I, this is like, I think this is probably the, one of the most definitive protocols out there like just you know the the level of composability that you know that that's involved here because you're you know integrating with so many different protocols you're breaking up tokens into you know their different parts you're leveraging some parts of the token you're offering uh you know, fixed yield and, uh, and, and volat you know, volatility on the other side. It's, um, it's super interesting, uh, which, you know, makes me wonder, given all the demand that there is for what you're offering, um, what that says about DeFi traders, you know, they, it, it seems to me, this is a sign of, you know, it, it's a pretty um, sophisticated group. Like, w what are your thoughts on this? So I think in terms of the user education, um, it, it's, it's definitely improved. I, I do think compared to when we started out in 2020, the level of sophistication of the DeFi user base has significantly improved because now mm -hmm. we're not just looking at a group of DGENs trying to punt on like shit coins but actually considering various kinds of instruments to try to maximize their earnings. And then on top of that, there are very serious institutions that are also involved in this particular segment. So in general, I think the, the literacy has improved. But at the same time, we're also seeing quite a lot of interest from retail users who are maybe interacting with protocol like ours for the first time. So... Um, I think for good and bad, because of the time of, uh, maybe it's the time of the cycle um, with meme coins, there exists a lot of users who are probably quite new to crypto and then started to explore like other ways to make earnings. Um, they stumbled upon Pendle and then they started asking questions that are, that, that are relatively um, amateurish, but hopefully with enough, enough time, they can grow into uh, more sophisticated traders. But I'm of the opinion that um, there will always be a small group of users who are very, very degen and sophisticated, but a broad, broad base of users would remain very passive and continue to follow the directions of KOLs and influencers. Um, but no doubt, the overall literacy has improved. Related to that, can you go into uh, the risks that users are taking when using Pendle? Yeah, sure. So multiple layers, but I think the most immediate one that any crypto protocol is subject to is the contract risk. Again, I think like unlike most, most other protocols, Pendle actually has multi layers uh, because Pendle is building on top of other protocols. As an example that I, um, I, I, I raise the the pool that we launched January last year. So mm -hmm. there's Rocket and then there's uh, Balancer, Aura and Pendle. So four different protocols involved in a single single um, value chain. If at any one point in time, touch wood, right? One of these protocols become vulnerable to attacks, the entire like Pendle sitting at the top of it would be affected. Mm -hmm. So, so this is a risk, um, as with, uh, like with, with the current pool setups, let's say like eigen layer, because Pendle is building on top of, um, I think there's the baseline eigen layer, and then there's the LRT protocol, and then there's Pendle. So any one of these two layers below Pendle becomes vulnerable, Pendle would be affected as well. Mm -hmm. So this is a level of risk. 
Um, and then I think another consideration is more on the market side. So a lot of people, again, like to my knowledge, are getting into YTs, not exactly knowing what YTs entail. But this is also, I think, the nature of the product because it is there to uh, facilitate speculations. So some users um, who with, with no clear understanding of how PT and YT works, they just buy into YT. They might end up getting airdrop tokens that, that could be worth less than whatever they paid for prior to the, the actual realization of the points. So, and then as a result, they could lose money. But this is, this is just, a, I think, a, a market risk that they need to factor in in their consideration of uh, the participation of the protocol. It, does that happen because the points narrative is super hyped right now? So YT tokens are getting really expensive. Um, and so, you know, people are buying YT tokens at a high price. And then what you're saying is that it, it might turn out that the points themselves aren't you know, when, when this YT token matures and, mm. you know, the yield actually um, is realized with points on top and so on, that yeah. that points aren't yeah. really worth as, as much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So you're overpaying. So it's, it's always a possibility, right? Um, who knows like when. So now I think YT traders or YT holders of EETH are in the money. But that's for uh, EETH specifically. There are other protocols that have not issued tokens that that could subject to, um, I mean, the situation that we just talked about. Their airdrop tokens might worth less than what people were anticipating. And then as a result of that, YT holders might be worse off. Ready to dive into the world of on-chain derivatives? Sin Futures is your decentralized portal to trading futures and perps with up to 100x leverage. Now live on Blast Mainnet, Sin Futures V3 combines limit orders and concentrated liquidity into a single unified liquidity model dubbed Oyster AMM, offering unparalleled capital efficiency. Earn triple airdrop rewards through an incentive program designed around Blast and Sin Future points. And join the new Trading Grand Prix competition to win a piece of the $500,000 prize pool. Visit sinfutures.com, that's S-Y-N futures.com to start your decentralized trading journey today. So each of these tokens has a maturity, uh, hmm. which happens when, when, where, like where, when the airdrop actually happens? No, so is the maturity is uh, preset, so the the airdrop can actually happen before or after the maturity, okay. but the maturity is there to refresh the, I think the, the, the pool. So, mm. um, I think like going back to STETH for simplicity's sake, uh, because STETH, uh, is an asset that has a, a bit more longevity. Um, typically we would work on quarterly, uh, like the, the maturities, um, happen on a quarterly basis. So end of March, end of June, end of September, end of December. Um, and then after every maturity, a new pool would set up to, to kind of um, extend like the number of pools that we have. So let's say after March, uh, the March pool expires, we would set up a new pool after um, like maybe a year from now, just so that users who want to have like a year long exposure can continue to participate in the pool. Mm. So in a case of restaking assets, there are actually some uncertainties. So we typically keep the maturities shorter uh, or mm. closer to the, the launch date. Um, so for one, because Eigenlayer is speculated to be live late Q2. So we try not to have maturities after, uh, for, for restaking assets, we try not to have maturities after June um, because we believe that with Eigenlayer coming live, there could be quite, quite, quite a lot of changes in terms of the way things work. Um, and a lot of these restaking protocols might have to undergo some structural changes. So mm -hmm. we wanna retain that flexibility and observe how things work before we 
become comfortable with issuing a longer maturities for assets for these assets. Mm, okay, mm. makes sense because the do you think the um, the price volatility for liquid restaking tokens might be too high at a time when you know Eigenlayer is launching and you know all these protocols building on top of Eigenlayer have to maybe adjust to you know how things shape up. Perhaps, perhaps, um, mm. but yeah, this this is beyond me because I don't follow the mm. market as attentively. Mm. Um, but I think at some point in time there will be a repricing, depending on how the market views the development of Eigenlayer. What do you mean? Because um, let's say if um, yeah, if if people are more hopeful of Eigenlayer the the current set of restaking protocols can get repriced higher um, and, and mm -hmm. vice versa. So, I mean, it's the risk that, as always, you know, when, when things are pre-launch, there's a lot of optimism because, you know, like you, we haven't seen all the problems that might happen when yeah. things are actually live. Yeah. Uh, and so maybe there's like this curve that still has to happen. Like right now, peak optimism, um, maybe I can layer launches. There are, you know, like people are, and the protocol itself is faced with reality. There is some <laughs> yeah. repricing and then maybe, you know, things start to pick up again as yeah. whatever problems or issues might arise, start yeah. getting resolved. Mm. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, super interesting stuff. And, and so like, and what I wanted to kind of clarify is that when these tokens, the closer they get to maturity, um, do they get the, the, how does it work? The YT and the PT start getting closer to the underlying obviously and and then that ratio is kind of is, is one so so or? yeah so um pt will if uh under normal circumstances pt should converge to the price of the underlying mm -hmm. such that at maturity one pt is equal to one underlying and then on and the other hand what happens to yt yt will gradually decrease to zero so because because the yield gets realized along the way, so towards maturity, it 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 will have less time to realize the yield. Um, and then at maturity, because it no longer receives any yield, it will become zero dollar in value. Mm, I see. Mm. Okay. So what YT is um the expectation of of how much yield a token will receive in the time Correct. before maturity. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So when it gets closer to maturity, it starts getting close to zero. Co correct. Yeah. So does that mean that YT holders, I mean, they'll have to sell that, you know, that token at some point before that happens in order to make money? No, so they don't. So whatever they realize, let's say if, if, if they're holding YT, all mm -hmm. the points that accrue prior to the maturity will remain. So okay. they don't have to do anything. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, but then the the point they, they'll accrue points, but what about like what about the yield, like the Same. state ETH yield? Yeah, so it will continue to get realized as mm -hmm. uh, time passes, um, and then they will just stop receiving yield from the underlying protocol at maturity. I see. Okay, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh my God, this is so interesting. How did you come up with all this? <laughs> so so I was a business major, but again, I think most of the things that I know about finance happens because of the experience at Kyber. Because Kyber mm -hmm. was, I think, the first wave of DeFi. Um, mm -hmm. I learned about DEXs and financial instruments because of that exper uh, experience. But of course, I have like other co-founders who are very brilliant and smart to to to, to contribute and 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 um, make this vision uh, a reality. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I think, you know, this is a very definitive uh, protocol, but, but there is a, a similar market in traditional finance, you know, there's, you know, interest derivatives market. Um, but I, I, I'd love to get your, um, 
your thoughts on how Pendle and how this this type of market is different uh, from mm. TradFi? I think um, in terms of the execution of transaction, so the Pendle Pendle utilizes AMM, whereas most of the interest rate swaps in TradFi happens over like OTC, mm. um, and they are a lot more elusive in that like only hedge funds, large institutions can get access to this kind of products. Users on the other hand, like retail users like me will, will not be able to, to, to get, um, access. So I think like, this is also a proposition of DeFi in general. Um, and then I think, um, that, that is, that is one of the, the, the core difference. And then, okay. With Pendle, the fun, uh, the, in terms of the mechanics, right? Pendle is actually tokenizing the future yield. So tokenizing the future yield and then in, into the token form and allow this to be traded more easily. Whereas in the case of TradFi, it's actually a swap of interest stream between the fix and floats. Um, so, so I think, um, again, by nature of like crypto, because there is the concept of tokenization, like this sort of, uh, what we, what I've just described about Pendle um, can happen only in crypto. So mm -hmm. mechanics wise, I think uh, quite different. Before we start wrapping up, I, I want to understand the business model, like mm. how the token plays a role um, mm. and how the protocol earns revenue, if it does. Sure. So the protocol has two sources of revenue. Uh, first one is swap fee because like, again, Pendle operates an AMM. So there is a swap fee whenever a trade trade happens. Now the, the, the swap fees will vary from pool to pool and also depending on the maturity, but on average, most of the pools will have 10, 10 basis, uh, like the, the, the fees around like 10 bips. Uh, and then the other, the other revenue component is actually the YT. So all the, all the YT that's minted, uh, 3% of that goes to Pendle. Now, so in terms of the token, uh, Pendle actually has, the Pendle itself doesn't have any utility, but when locked in the VE Pendle contract, uh, between say one week and two years, there are three utilities. So first one is, um, with VE Pendle, there's the boosting of LP APY. Because like if you're a liquidity provider and you have VE Pendle, you get boosting. Uh, the second one is for you, uh, the, the, the voting of incentives. Because every week, Pendle has a budget of incentives that can be channeled to the pools as liquidity incentive. And as VE Pendle holder, uh, you can vote for how the incentives to be channeled to the pools of your of your interests. Um, so again, like this is, I think, more on the voting right perspective. And then the third is a claim to to the uh, to the swap fee, because after voting, uh, whatever revenue swap fee that the 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 pool earns gets redistributed back to the VE panel holder. So this is. Um, yeah, like just just as a way to to incentivize voting. Mm. Okay, so uh, sorry. Okay, so Pendle is locked in a a, a liquidity pool about called VE Pendle, mm. um, and then uh, VE Pendle holders, uh, um, like people yeah. who are providing liquidity to that uh, pool yeah. with Pendle tokens, they can um, receive a, a, a portion of the swap fees. Yes. Right? And then also, is it VE Pendle uh, LPs, the ones uh, that have the right to vote as well on Correct. incentives? Okay. Correct. So, yeah. and that vote is for incentives for LPs in other pools? Uh, any pool. Like, uh, okay. you can vote for any pool of your choice. E even if you're not LPing in, in those pools? Correct. Ah. And, and, yeah. and are those incentives, where are they coming from? Is it incentives from like uh, external protocols that are uh, 
part of those yeah. schools or so the incentives are actually in like the pendle because like pendle okay. has um emissions that we use to uh, encourage deposits into the liquidity pools mm -hmm. so for users who are voting using ve pendle that's the like that pendle emission is is what they are channeling i see okay um and you also mentioned that there was like a these multipliers mm. issued by the other protocols themselves. That's not voted on. That's, you know, kind of determined by the yeah. external protocols, right? That is correct. Okay. So they all, so they're voting on Pendle incentives for liquidity pools, um, for, you know, all these different strategies. Mm. Um, and then they are also getting a percentage of, uh, swap fees. The swap fees. Okay, Correct. cool. And yeah. then um, that's the Pendle protocol. And then the Pendle protocol itself gets, you said, 10 basis points of the swaps. Yeah, correct. So the Pendle protocol currently does not have, uh, I mean, the, the, the protocol treasury redistribute all the fees collected back to VE Pendle holders. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So th those 10 bases go directly to Pendle holders. Correct. VE Pendle holders. Yeah. Okay, got it. Um, do you think, I mean, could you have made this without a token? I think the, the, the role of the token is actually quite important in our case to incentive, incentivize liquidity because as an AMM, if we don't have liquidity, it's hard to encourage activity. Uh, right. and also like, yeah, for assets that we're dealing with, they are relatively like they're pretty long tail because um, they're derivative of like other assets. So I think having the, the incentives helped us bootstrap liquidity to kickstart a certain kind of uh, activity. Do you think that tokens for DeFi protocols, I mean, is, is, is it their role to, to kind of solve this cold start problem um, and, you know, kickstart activity um, and then potentially down the line maybe they'll be less useful like yeah like like you said it's it's good to have pendle incentives now uh incentives liquidity you know but like once a protocol is running like it's uh, you know people understand the use case whatever maybe you you won't need as as much pendle incentives it is possible so the emission can be gradually reduced such that the protocol becomes more um deflationary so as long as we are, I think, um, yeah, as, as with most, most instances, the goal is always to reduce the dependency on the uh, protocol token to, to encourage activity. If we get to the point where activities can happen more organically, then I think we can gradually wind down the, the token. But I think it will still continue to exist. It's just that the emission can be drastically reduced. Right, makes sense. And is that something that VE uh, Pendle holders also vote on, like the emissions? Um, yes. Uh, so in terms of emissions right now, not yet. Uh, mm. What we plan to do is to gradually open up more avenues that VE Pendle holders can vote on. Currently, it's still confined to the, the incentives. Okay, got it. Awesome. Um, this this was all so interesting. And then a uh, final question and, mm -hmm. and to wrap up, what's next for Pendle? Like what are the, the main milestones that you're working for? So for this year, aside from focusing on the markets that we are already working on, like basically trying to build up the, the, the features that we have already in place, it's to also develop V3. Because I think V3 is... I, I think some, um, as per our experience operating V2, we observe like some bottlenecks on, um, like our, our system. So we are, we actually have a way and, um, an implementation that can improve, uh, say capital efficiency of, um, uh, yield trading. And then on top of that, I think we can also enable newer use cases that V2 cannot, cannot enable just yet. So, um, I think it might still, it's still, it's still premature for me to, to, to disclose, uh, too much information, but in terms of what I can share, 
um, we're hoping to release V3 by the end of the year. Um, so now it's really just on the one hand, be very aggressive with listing assets that can improve our traction and the fundamentals. And then on the other hand, we have to ensure that we have sufficient resources to develop V3, which can be a very significant step for us to, 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 uh, to take. Interesting. Can you um, hint at what, what some of those new use cases are? Generally, I think um, anything that's got to do with rates, we, we try to um, we try to enable. So, um, borrowing rates is an area that we are quite interested in. Um, hmm. Now we are we we have enabled the trading of lending rates, but we're not doing it at scale. So we imagine that we can potentially unlock a lot more opportunities if we can enable the trading of yield at scale. So as an example, right? Right now with Pendle V2, if a user is interested in acquiring, let's say $50,000 worth of YT, depending on the depth of the pool, now let's just assume by like $5 million pool size, on a $50,000 worth of YT trade, the trade could incur maybe one to 2% price impact. So it's actually, I mean, if you're a small time trader, it's okay. Like if, if you're trading only a few thousand dollars, it's probably okay. But if you're an institution and you want to trade, let's say like a million dollar of YT, you would have to break up the trade into many, many different clips of say 30, 40,000 per transaction. And then um, on top of that, you might also have to factor in like price impact, like one, 2% price impact. So that's not a good experience for traders. So what we'll have to do with V3 is focus on these use cases, but look at implementations that can scale um, the operation. Awesome. Okay. So looking at scaling Pendle is next. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Uh, Tian, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, super interesting stuff. Um, and yeah, we'll be obviously sure to cover all of your next steps at the Defiant. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me.